Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with custom knife maker Brent Smith of Bald Man Knife and Tool. Now, I first met Brent right here as a listener of the show. At some point early on, maybe through the comment section, I think Brent let me know he was making knives. But it wasn't until I met him at Blade Show 2021, just by chance, and got a chance to examine one of his creations, did I understand how humble Brent was being. This was a fixed blade with an ergonomically perfect handle and a black Damascus blade so finely ground, it would have been just at home in the kitchen doing the most detailed of work. Uh, Bald Man Knife and Tool offers fixed blades of the EDC camp and cooking variety with clean, refined lines and aesthetic. And that's about all I know, but we're going to find out more right here. But before we do, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you know when new up loads come out uh, and then download us and listen to us wherever you uh, check out podcasts. Uh, so if you if you can't see the video, you can always listen when you're driving or mowing the lawn. And then there's always Patreon. If you think what we do here is valuable and you want to check out all the uh, exclusive opportunities you get through supporting the show, you can do that by going to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Hey, Brent, welcome to the show. Hey, Bob. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's my pleasure. So the way I remember it is, um, you know, my my first experience at Blade Show was this year, 20 or this past year, 2021. And uh, maybe like a lot of people who have started relationships with various knife people uh, anonymous, anonymously over over the Web, finally get to meet people. And it's like this this cool extra other experience. But it's a shock to see what people look like. And you appeared out of the blue and you're like, hey, Bob, it's Brent. And I was like, Brent, oh, Brent. And I I knew who you were from Patreon and and uh, and just from commenting on the show. And of course, I asked what you were carrying on your hip. I was like, I thought it was something you had just bought there. You showed it to me and I looked at my like, who made this? This is exquisite. Oh, I, I made that. <laughs> so when did you yeah. start doing this? Man, it's been, uh, let's see, uh, almost a year and a half now. Um, I just started tinkering around. So I think I had sent you in some uh, some knives from a, another local maker here, uh, Romis Knives, Gordon Romis, um, just to review, do a little tabletop review on. And um, honestly, whenever I went to go get those knives from him, uh, you know, that was right around when uh, COVID started. And so I really started searching around for local knife makers, right? There was a uh, blade show was canceled. There was, you know, people were limited on what they were doing. And um, <clears throat> I went and I saw his shop and bought a couple knives from him and just picked his brain. And I left there thinking, man, this looks like fun. I got to give this a go. Um, so yeah, man, I, I did what, you know, if you hear a lot of knife makers stories, um, I did what most guys do, and I went and grabbed a couple old files, and I annealed them, and it was just went from there. I got a little one by thirty from Harbor Freight, and uh, man, I think I ground out probably thirty knives on that little one by thirty. Just gave it a workout um, before I realized real quick, you know, there's needed to step up and get something a little better. And but I got bit by the bug, so for sure that was that was what uh, got me going. Uh, you were a collector beforehand, right? Uh, someone who Correct. was already rabid about knives. Yeah, so I had been collecting knives for probably six years uh, before that. Uh, and then those six years, you know, it was primarily folders, but I had some fixed blades, some camp knives, um, some little EDCs every once in a while. Um, and that's really what got me bit was doing the EDC kind of folder knives and uh, just really transitioned into this. Uh, were you, uh, before you started making them 
and making these really uh the one that you're making a lot your i think your most popular model is called the clipper is that correct correct, correct. um so uh, before you kind of um got to the point where you were making um a regular model and you have a couple and i want to talk to you about your strategy and, and how you plan all that out uh but how did you get to the point where you felt like well i guess i should i should say did you always know that you wanted to be making models uh and perfecting the same models uh or or how did that happen right so um you know when i started out it was uh i didn't have any particular models you know i'm the type of person i'm really tactile um so i can draw i can sketch a few things out uh, i'm not an artist by any stretch of the means but um i can sketch some things out but really it takes me getting it in hand to really play with it and figure out what i like so um i started out uh, like a lot of knife makers where you do one design here one design there um and i didn't have a whole lot of consistency i was i was and i still feel like i'm uh uh it's taken me a, this past year and a half or so to really figure out my design style and what I like out of a knife. You know, everything mm -hmm. gets a little tweak here and there. So like the knife you saw at Blade Show, that was kind of the first generation of this clipper knife. Um, it had about a four inch blade. Um, I had, um, you know, I didn't do any sharpening choil. So it was just the edge was just straight blunt. Didn't have any finger guard on it or hand guard on it. Um, and, and then I slowly started tweaking that design. I, I, I really liked that design, uh, but it needed a few modifications. So this clipper model came out of that, uh, because again, I, I have made some kitchen knives, made some larger choppers and things. Um, but really my heart again was EDC knives. And so if I can EDC a fixed blade knife, I'm going to do it. And that's really where I started pushing into, hard was doing the edc stuff yeah uh, i'm a big uh daily carrier of uh fixed blades um uh, generally the fixed blades i carry are less edc they're more um you know uh, uh self-defense-y it's just my taste right, you know right. uh i i have my chore type knives in my pockets usually but uh were you um before you actually took the dive into the knife making and you were collecting were you collecting fixed blade knives? Uh, were you trying to carry fixed blade knives on a regular basis? You know, I typically didn't. So my day job is I, I am a uh, the shop foreman of a small um, repair shop, uh, auto repair shop. And so for me, I have a really specific um, set of parameters that I look for in an EDC knife. Mm -hmm. So like I have my knife that I carry on me um, and, and that's... Uh, this little guy, the the Sage uh, in M4 that I carry on me. Again, that's a specific thing because I work on cars. I found I needed this wire clip. Otherwise, if I don't, I'm going to wind up rubbing up. Oh, hold on. Sorry about that, gentlemen. <laughs> no I problem. I am in my shop, and uh, that was the first time my compressor kicked on tonight. So <laughs> I thought I had it off. Um, anyway, so I, so wait, you know, wait. You were saying folders. about the wire clip. Why do you? So I work on cars, right? So I found that if I have a regular clip, it's not all the time, but I stand more of a chance of scratching paint on a car. You know, you get in and out of cars, uh, yeah. and you can gouge a steering wheel, things like that. Yep. So I, I carry, again, the specific, I needed something lightweight, you know, and the wire clip does the deal for not uh, running the risk of damaging anything. So no, I did not carry fixed blades in my normal carry every day. Um, I carried folders, but uh, on the weekends, I would find myself carrying fixed blades every now mm -hmm. and then. And uh, that's that's where that came from. Yeah, I find uh, kind of the same way, except uh, I I started uh, bringing the uh, the the daily carry into my life a little while ago. But before I did that, it was every Saturday and Sunday. It's like I'm going out in the back. You know, I got work to do out back. That meant like you know, oh, I can bring all my knives or oh, some yeah. of my knives back there, try them out, carry them, this kind of thing. Um, 
So uh, I'm a little bit curious about your timing. You you said it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. That's when you started uh, kind of getting serious about knife making. Was was there any was that totally coincidental, or were you looking yeah. for something to do with extra time? Yeah, again, I had no extra time. Um, <laughs> we were Florida. No, you know. Florida never really cared about the pandemic, to be honest. You know, it's hit or miss whether anybody's concerned. Um, and so we had most places were open, you know, being auto repair, we were an essential business. So right. we stayed open. I had to go into work uh, despite whether I wanted to stay home or not. And um, <clears throat> so, no, we were, we were actually busier than ever. <laughs> and uh, no, can... no teleworking uh, at a car shop, huh? <laughs> No, no, can't phone that job in. That's for sure. So um, that that didn't have anything to do with it. Again, other than, you know, you're kind of other than work, I was locked in and not being able to travel around and go to, you know, uh, stores and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it was uh, again, I thought what a perfect time to look for some local makers to me and see if I can meet them and see what they make and how they make it and buy some of their stuff in this time so that's where that came out of really okay so you you get the one by 30 or 32 mm -hmm. and you and you get you get your first sort of rudimentary set of tools you seek out yep. these knife makers you meet mr romis um mm -hmm. did you you said you picked his brain and you you really got uh you know tried to get as much information from him as possible did that uh did that veer into the practical realm were you at his shop did you learn things in that sort of practical sense so again when i pick his brain you know i come from that background of of wanting to know how things work and uh wanting to know how to um do things of tactical or tactile hmm. and um I, I like to figure things out and tinker with stuff i always have um so it wasn't that I picked his brain on how to make knives. It was more seeing his setup, seeing his shop and uh, just kind of why he does what he does. And, uh, and, you know, I did go over and he, you know, he's a great guy. And so he's, he's made sure when I talk to him, I'm free to pick his brain and come over if I need to. I've been over there oh, once or twice uh, in the past year and a half, but, you know, once I got to making, that was just, it, it became a come home from work and uh, spend an hour or so with my wife and kids and then uh, come out here in the shed and work until 10, 12, one o'clock at night and just grind stuff out. And uh, that just has not let up here over the last year or so. Uh, do the, uh, the neighbors care? I always kind of wonder that because I have a shed too and I only... Uh, ever you know do use power tools back there you know during the daytime right. but but i've often thought about what if i were a knife maker and i was and i needed this time uh, is that ever an issue for you um it has not been an issue for me uh i haven't you know i talk with my neighbors we're in good relationships still so um you know they they honestly um it hasn't been an issue now i, I did make a a strategic choice not to forge anything uh, for yeah. a couple of reasons. One is that definitely would have drove the neighbors nuts. Two is, man, I'm 40 years old and I've been working nonstop physical labor for years. So I got mm. shoulders that are that are sore and tired and my hands are always, always moving. So, um, you know, that that definitely played into me not forging knives uh, for the noise factor and just the low stress and impact on the body that, that, uh, I didn't want that forging to take. <laughs> wow. Do you, well, do you find, um, because I've heard other people, actually someone I was just speaking with recently, uh, was mentioning some of the, some of the challenges of having a bad back, but standing at a grinder and doing stock removal. And, and, uh, he sort of developed a, you know, a way to do it, to accommodate his own, you know, issues, but, uh, do you, do you find any repetitive stress from the kind of knife making you do? No, really? I don't. Um, I think, you know, it, it's pretty low stress compared to what I'm used to doing. So no, I haven't had any, any issues with that. Um, for sure. If I was, uh, doing this full time, um, grinding out batches of knives, um, uh, I, I think I'd start to feel that repetitive motion. Um, and you know, that's, it comes with the territory, right? So you just got to take yeah. breaks. And, you know, there are times when I, I do get tired and you just got to 
you know, sit down and scroll through your Instagram feed for 15 minutes and then get back at it, right? Yeah, and I would imagine that's the best thing to do for saving materials, possibly saving your fingers. But, you know, you don't want to be working on something and then just have that uh, have that momentary lapse of focus and then and then have you know trash a blade or suddenly i'm making the right. shortest blade i've ever made you know? <laughs> yep no that's that's for sure um and you know you do get in moments where you grind something and the grind just isn't going the way you want and that's the perfect time to take a break so uh, and get back at it well walk me into your process uh let's talk about the clipper and uh you've, you you've done something interesting recently with the clipper you've been making a quarter inch thick version <laughs> yeah. and uh it's it's audacious i love it but but tell me about um the decision to do that but also tell me about what it's like what your process is like making one of these knives so again so this is you know you're talking about that uh the, yeah. I call it the thicker clipper here um and that is a quarter inch thick uh <laughs> blade stock um so you know i i made a couple of these out of um 330 seconds uh, stock. So like this is a 330 seconds that I'm working on right now. I have, uh, I still need to um, get my maker's mark on there. Um, and that one is full flat ground, um, about a zero edge. So you can see wow. there's, there's like no edge on there. Uh, so I did these and I, I don't have um, a heat treat kiln here. Uh, so I do batches of work and I on my stainless steel knives and I send those to Peter's to have heat treated. Mm -hmm. So um, while I was doing that, while those knives were out of heat treat, I had some high carbon steel quarter inch thick that I had made a couple choppers out of. And I just thought, man, that'd be kind of fun yeah. to see what would happen. So I did. I took that quarter inch stock and I did my clipper model and you get this thing in hand and it is so fun. Now you can, so you can see, I'll hold these up here. The difference in uh blade. Oh my <laughs> God. Right. Yeah. Um, so they are not slicers, but man, yeah. I take these and I slam these. I mean, if you look through my Instagram mural, you'll see when I'm, when I'm playing around with them, I literally take them from standing and throw them into a two by four lane on the ground. Uh, and it does not phase them. They're, they're just a fun EDC knife and you know, you've got it in hand. It's, I do uh, drill out the handle material or the, uh, where the handle covers um, to lighten it up a to little bit. Yeah. Not, not that it does a whole lot of good, but um, they're just fun knives. And, and I, I've been carrying, the first one I made, the prototype, um, and I, I love this thing. It's just fun. It, that's what, what it really got it really came out of that, and it and I got it out of um, I, I did it and I took it over to a buddy's place uh, here in town, and he put it in his hands, and his wife was there, and both of them just said, "We need one of these. This uh -huh. thing is awesome. You got to make more of these." So, yeah, so I'm actually working on some uh, S35. I'm getting ready to profile out of, it's just shy of quarter inch. Um, but, yeah, I'll be doing some S35 in this quarter inch thick stock. So, yeah, I mean, this is the prototype. You can see it's, so got, cool. it's got gunk all over the blade from me carrying it. And, again, <laughs> you just, you can really thrash on these. They're fun. So besides your friends, what, what, what has the knife, how has the knife world reacted, you know, just through Instagram or, um, you know, honestly, I have made some really good friends online. Um, so it, it's just been really cool to be a part of the community and, you know, see people that reach out from across the country that, that purchase knives. Um, it's always a cool feeling whenever you see that, that happen. Uh, the reason I asked is because there's such a emphasis placed uh, to the uh, you know the current day collector on thinness behind the edge mm -hmm. and sliciness and all this, and that's you know that's how I identify your knives initially were with that first one yeah. that I experienced, and then uh, a lot of the ones I've seen on your um, page, which are just thin, and your your kitchen knives and that Tanto EDC Tanto, they all seem yeah. very thin, and then here comes this Goliath that's uh oh that's, uh, the, uh, oh, that's, that's that that edc tanto there oh, that's pretty uh, again, slick. that's that's 
again, this was 330 seconds and I went zero behind the edge on this. And um, yeah, <laughs> it's fun with the uh, hot pink uh, Kydex. Oh, yeah. Got to have the hot pink Kydex <laughs> just before the assassination. That's what they see. Right. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, going thin behind the edge. Right. So I I, I really work on my grinding skills um, that that was kind of the the uh what was behind doing the kitchen knives kind of the culinary stuff was just to really learn that and those guys get crazy about their geometries mm -hmm. and i am not a um I, i'm not a big like chef and i don't do a lot of food prep and stuff and so that was for me just something really interesting to see how those knives are made and see what people like out of those and push myself again being a new maker, I feel like I'm always pushing myself uh, right. to do something different, but uh, to push those grinds really thin. And uh, especially when you get to grinding, you don't want to overheat the steel after it's heat treated. You know, so uh, my chef knives and uh, pairing knives, I use a 16th inch stock uh, steel for those. Okay. And so they start out thin. So I have a, a high carbon one here that uh, hmm. starts out... Uh, really nice and thin to begin with and then when you can make that even thinner behind the edge uh so you know that's 16th inch stock there um and so that's where it came from but again the the thicker clipper was just something yeah. super fun to do um, oh yeah and i love those and i get questions whenever guys see them and i post them you know oh how does it slice well i mean it's guess it's a, <laughs> it is an inch tall just just over an inch tall and it's a so it's literally a quarter uh, a quarter of the thickness of the height oh, <laughs> so uh no it doesn't slice great but man it's fun and and it does cut you know i grind even though um uh, i do that saber grind it uh i do grind them to about a zero edge or uh and so behind the edge it's not that thick but it tapers so quick that it kind of doesn't matter Right, right. I mean, that's you're not buying that knife for its its slicey qualities. You're buying yeah. it for its robustness and its and its coolness. Right. Um, right. So the I want to talk about doing the kitchen knives in the real thin grinds for a second. Mm -hmm. What does it look like when you botch a kitchen knife? For oh, example? if you botch a kitchen knife, um, you know you wind up not having as tall of a blade, or you just mess up the whole heat treat. Right. So. Uh, you can totally mess up the heat treat uh, when you're grinding something that's a 16th of an inch thick. And if you just hold on it too long or you're doing passes on the grinder and you think, you know, you do one pass and you think, oh, that wasn't too bad. And by the time you get halfway through that second pass, all of a sudden your thumb is feeling that heat. You, you, you know, you just got that thing too hot. So um, that's really the challenge on those. So when you feel the heat, you, you you do one pass. Oh, that wasn't so bad. I'll go another one without cooling it down in water or whatever you cool it in. Right. And you're going and you're halfway and you feel that heat. What do you do? Because if you if you keep going, you will burn your thumb and you will burn the edge and and oh, yeah. and, and the heat treat. But if you stop, you've ha you've ground halfway down the blade. I guess maybe that might be easier to recover from. But yeah, um, you know, you get the feel for the heat and um you know, ultimately, if you get it too hot, you got two choices, scrap it, or you can, if you didn't grind it too thin already, you can go back and you can anneal it and you can start back over. So you, get, you really got two choices if you get it too hot. Man. So I guess just don't get it too hot. I mean, that's got to be heartbreaking to get that far and then, and then have to just, okay, got to start from scratch. Yep. So what, it, what does it look like when you start from scratch? Take me through this process of making one of these. So again, starting from scratch, you know, when I first did my first knife designs, um, whenever I'm working on doing a design and I'm kind of prototyping that out, I will do a rough sketch of it and then I'll transfer that over to the steel. Personally, again, I found I can draw stuff on paper. I usually won't draw it to scale. I started trying to do uh, drawing to scale on paper so I could transfer it over. I, that just doesn't work for me. Um, I have to draw something small, just kind of sit there and sketch out a bunch of stuff. And then I grab a steel bar. Again, when I'm prototyping stuff out, I'll do a high carbon steel 
so I can quench that. I can do all that here um, with a you know a propane forge, hmm. and um, <clears throat> and I'll draw. I'll just sit there and start scratching it out, you know, with a, a pen or a marker on the steel, and you know, grab my acetone, wipe it off, and just keep tweaking it. And then once I grind them out, they get tweaked again. And um, so that's really the process. And once I get one ground out and I'm happy with the way the, uh, the handle feels and um, the, the blade shape is in relation to that, then that's whenever I'll start grinding my profile and I can, I can go through that, that aspect of it. Uh, that's uh, surprising to hear because they all look uh, very uniform. And I think of making knives uh, by hand from scratch, even if you have a template that you're working from each time, I would imagine that doing it by hand and having a consistent model mm -hmm. um, be produced each time is, uh, well, the, the payoff of, of doing the same model over and over is that you, you get to that, mm -hmm. that position. But yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know, so I do that where once I get that model and I and I like the way it feels, I will do a uh, like a cardboard template or I'll take some Kydex and do a template out of Kydex. So that way I do have a pattern that from then on I can trace onto my steel and get that uniformity. Um, yeah, when I first started, I was doing kind of popcorn designs. So I, I didn't really know exactly what I wanted and what I liked. And so I had all these ideas swirling around in my head and I would just do them. I would make them, you know, yeah. for me, I have to make it, get it in hand and see what I think. And I, and I like all those designs I did. And there were different tweaks that I did on them uh, to get where I'm at now. Now I'm at a place where I feel like um, there is a lot of value in um, doing multiple different designs and kind of changing them up each time. Uh, but where I'm at is I really want to push myself to have repeatability in mm -hmm. these models okay. and have that consistency. You know, it's, it is a hard thing to do 10 knives and have them all as close to identical as possible. And that's a, a fun challenge for me to do. Um, at this stage right now, I don't have my profiles water jetted out. I still profile them out on a bandsaw and with my, or on a little porta band and on my grinder. And so being, being able to do that is uh, definitely has its challenges, um, but it's really fun to do and, <laughs> and, to, and to see that, that progression and be able to lay them all out next to each other and go, man, they're so close. There might be a little differences, you know, they might be an eighth of an inch off here and there, you know, eighth inch difference in length between them. But, man, they're so close that uh, it's really fun to be able to to really hone my skills yeah. and see that progression. I mean, that's the great, probably the best way to hone those skills. It's like the famous Bruce Lee quote, I'd rather fight a man who knows a thousand kicks than a man who practices one kick a thousand times, you know, yeah. uh, because you can really dial it in. And in doing so, then... You know, next time you want to use that, bring that same skill to bear on a totally different design, you've got it. You've mm -hmm. already, you've already, you know, created it. Uh, I was going to ask about that repeatability, whether that's a goal. And um, yeah, I mean, obviously it is. You can see it. Yeah. Uh, you can see it already in your stuff. What you said there was, there were a whole bunch of knives in that uh, beginning uh, part where you're just mm -hmm. kind of getting, cutting your teeth. What was the coolest one that you left on the cutting room floor, so to speak, and you, that you might want to resurrect someday when right. you feel your chops are better? Right. I think, um, you know, there's a few designs that I did that that uh, I really like. So there's one of after I did my two file knives that were my first knives, I, I ordered some 01 tool steel. Again, I knew I could heat treat that. I knew it was a really good uh, high carbon steel. Uh, a tough steel to use. And uh, I had a, a good friend and he wanted me to make him something uh, in his words, make me a knife. That's like, I like my women big and curvy. So <laughs> <laughs> I made, I made kind of a, a hunting knife that it, it almost looks like it has a recurve on it, but it doesn't, it has a big belly on it. Um, and I really like that knife. Um, 
<clears throat> it had its challenges for me with my limited tool set at that time. And uh, I, I will probably do some more of those, um, you know, if I get the time. Because um, I, I really did like that knife. Um, but again, for me, I, I like having this clipper model. It's, uh, it's small enough that I can EDC it. And so I, re I really like sticking with that. So in terms of your um, production model, bless you, in terms of your production model, or if that was a cough, I take yeah. it back. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, uh, oh, uh, so you've got the uh, regular production models. In terms of your uh, business model as a custom maker, do you take um, custom orders or are you right now at the point where you're a drop you can only kind of manage drops how's that working for you and how do you where do you want it to go yeah so i would like to I, i'm moving towards making it to more of a drop um uh a process here um uh, i i was taking custom orders and i'll still take some custom orders from time to time if it's something that's in my wheelhouse uh you know Clearly, there are things that are just other guys make, and they're not really my style or my wheelhouse. And I'm devoting a ton of time right now to this Clipper model and um, really producing these out, so I can um, I can have a, a large selection of these. Um, part of the thing with being a custom knife maker that I that I've learned over this last year is there's a couple avenues, and one is that taking orders. Um, and doing custom work and and there are guys that do incredible jobs at that um that have a passion for doing that the other side of it is is having a model that you can do repeatedly and you can work on batches of those and that uh i really enjoy doing that and so that's really what i'm moving towards now that i've had this last year and a half to to hone in on what i want to do and how i want my my business to go um, that's, that's really what I'm focusing on right now is having that repeatability of, uh, just maybe a, at most a handful of models right now, but really I'm sticking with this clipper, um, and a couple variations, you know, I'll have different grinds on them and, uh, I've got a, I've got some that are in the four inch blade that, I, that I'm, uh, blade length that I'm doing, but, um, I really like this model and everybody that that's gotten one in their hands is, is uh, given me really good feedback on it. And uh, so, yeah, that's where I'm, I'm heading right now. Like I said, there's still room for custom orders here and there, but I am a little more choosy on that. You know, it, it just hearing you say this uh, makes me think, cause I've heard um, a number of people uh, who've, who've been making knives longer um, say that when they started they had to take custom orders they had to go with books it's kind of the only way to guarantee future sales and to guarantee that um i don't know that you didn't become uh inane or or mm -hmm. not you know um and then and then they worked really hard to get through their books so that they could right you know free themselves of it and and i'm starting to get the feeling that there's a newer paradigm emerging. You're kind of part of it, and and uh, and 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 others that kind of approach it this way. And and it's through the benefit of Instagram and and sort of immediately keeping people up to date on what you're doing and the models that you're producing. Um, that maybe maybe knife makers in the future and present and in, and as we move into the future won't have to feel like they have to take on orders. I, I don't know. What do you think about that? Right. So I think whenever you get into the custom orders and when you're doing uh, multiple different designs, you know, there's obviously different price points, right? When you get into doing custom orders, your your price point is going to be higher. Um, my kind of goal, uh, again, the first year or so, I had my prices pretty low um, and, and that was by design. I, I looked at my first year as school. This is school for me. And if I can have, uh, if I can make a product that I am um, proud of and I can sell that and I can supplement and have other people finance my schooling, I'm going to do that. And so that was my mindset going into that first year was school. This is education for me. And 
whether I'm coming out of pocket for this or, uh, again, the the goal was to be able to have people supplement and pay me for that. So um, that was my mindset. You, you know, when you do that custom work back to that is you you have a higher price point that you have to reach. You're doing one knife at a time, maybe two or three. And so those knives become more costly because of that. Whenever you get into being able to do drops and you're doing 10, 20, 30, 40 knives at a time, you're able to bring that price point down because you can do some batch work in there. You can get your, um, like if you're like me and you send out for heat treat, that uh, brings down some of that cost on heat treat because you're able to spread that out. Even, um, you know, if you're heat treating yourself, just the time you spend doing that, uh, you're able to spread that out over those knives and and speed that up a little. And that's really my goal with doing going kind of the drop model is keeping my knives at a lower price point um, and, and being able to do that. It, having the a model that you're perfecting over time will also allow you to do that and keep that price point down. Correct. Because there's less less of a learning curve as you yeah. go too. When you're when you're learning, everything takes twice as long. And, and, and you really do see yourself speeding up, not only speeding up, but you see the quality getting better at the same time, which is super cool. Whenever, you know, you're first grinding again, the, the level up between the one by 30 grinder and a two by 72 is light years. And mm -hmm. so leveling up to that, um, and adding, uh, tool arms and different, um, different wheels, you know, whether it's a contact wheel or a small wheel attachment or uh, a flat platen or a slack platen, whatever you're able to add um, just opens up doors to so many more options. And so, yeah, grinding out on a one by 30 that you push on it a, just barely too hard or, and it bogs down and stops, that's a, that's a time killer. And, um, and then you move to a two by 72 and things just, they, they fire, they go quick. Um, <clears throat> and then you see that quality again, like I said, at the same time, you see not only are you getting more efficient, more proficient at your job, um, but your, your quality is going up and that's really cool. Yeah. And, and uh, you have a real excuse to upgrade your tools. I mean, you can see, you can see a real difference. I'm just thinking I have a, a two by 42 craftsman and I noodle around with it. And, and, uh, I, I have, I have it bolted to a table that I pull out of my shed and bring out an extension. Cord. It is not ideal, you know? And so with my current setup, I could never have a two by 72. And that's what I tell myself. There, there's a whole bunch of things. I find it very pleasurable. I think it's really fun. It's not something I would do as a, um, as a, as a career, uh, just because I, I think it takes a lot more than just being good with your hands. I'm good with my hands, right. but it obviously takes a lot more to be a small businessman. Right. What do you find is the, like f for me thinking about someone in your position, I think, how do you break through the noise of the industry? I mean, it's a small industry relative to many others, but it's huge compared to the knife industry of the past. Mm -hmm. So I wonder with, with all the new makers and, but there are a whole bunch of new collectors too. So that it's like a uh, supply and demand seem to be going up kind of simultaneously. How do you break through the noise? How do you get bald man knife and tool noticed? Um, man, that is a great question. <laughs> um, you know, there's ultimately it's um, sticking to what you enjoy. Um, it, again, I, I got bit by the bug to do this. So I would be doing this uh, regardless of whether, you know, whether I'm making money at it or not. And um, clearly having a full-time job that I don't have to worry about this right now, making money, you know, yes, that is the plan. That's the dream is to be a full-time knife maker. I would love that more than anything. Um, I'm passionate about it. I enjoy it, you know, uh, and so, yeah, that's the dream is to be able to do that. That's the plan. Um, but until then, I'm able to come out here in the shop and grind away on knives. And it's fun. There, there are times when obviously, like everything else, you get frustrated because things aren't going your way. 
you you glue up some scales or whatever and it doesn't take or you know you you glue them up and then you go and start shaping them and then all of a sudden you look and you got you know one of them popped and you're you know you want to throw the thing across the shop but at the end of the day it's enjoyable and it's fun and, and if it wasn't i i wouldn't be able to do it but um man i i knew that this was really what i enjoyed doing and so that's what you have to have uh regardless of what else you have to set yourself apart you have to be able to enjoy what you're doing um and, and that's what i think i've found here is something i enjoy doing regardless of what kind of dividends it pays back well and you're in a great position because you are established in your life outside of knife making and you have already um i mean it, it's probably hard for you to see this maybe or, or maybe not but you've all already you're like you you have proven that you're very good at it and that with a lot of time you'll be you know outstanding at it you're in a great position because your life isn't depending on it at this mm -hmm. moment so right. you can really take your time to you know internalize whatever it is however it is to become a knife maker without the sort of Damocles over your head. Right. No, I appreciate that. You know, uh, it, it's definitely one of those things where you do have those moments where you think, man, is this ever going to work? Um, and then you, you, you actually, you, you sit and you talk and you think about it and you realize for me, I'm only a year and a half in. And so when I look at the trajectory that I've had over this last year and a half, you know, I, I feel like at the end of the day, I'm in a good spot. I've done what I accomplished. You know, you want, we always want more. Everybody wants more. And in, the, um, in our Instagram culture, you want everything right now and, and the internet and everything. Like we're used to getting what we want right now. And if I want this to be a business that can support my family um, and it's not happening right now, there are times whenever I get frustrated or I get down on it. Um, but at the end of the day, like I said, when you sit, <clears throat> when I sit and I say, okay, what was my goal when I started out? Well, my goal when I started out was to be doing a hobby that I enjoyed and be having that be supplemented. Well, I've been successful in that, right? Like right. I, I have been, I can say, yes, I've been successful in that. Now, is it paying for, is it feeding my family right now? No, it's not. But um, I've been successful in accomplishing my goals. So right. the next year and a half, what's the goal for the next year and a half? Well, that's what, well, that's what I'm pushing at right now is what that next goal is. It's interesting, the mission creep, right? Because you started, I just want a hobby that I'm going to mm -hmm. be good at and, and I can supplement, you know. And then all of a sudden you're like, but it's not supporting my family. I'm like, yeah, that's that's the beauty of that. Of That's positive mission creep because you love it so much. You want it to, to get there. Exactly. And, and so what will it look like? I, obviously, you fantasize about it. Who doesn't? Oh, when right. I get to leave my day job and, and do the thing I really love. What, what are the conditions that would be ideal for you to make that move? Well, again, you know, the, the ultimate condition whenever you have a family that, that relies on you is to be able to support them. And so, you know, as soon as that's able to happen and I see that trajectory, that's, um, <clears throat> that's when that would be, be a viable option. Uh, until then, like I said, you just have to refocus and keep your mind on enjoying what you're doing, perfecting your craft and, uh, and getting better with each each uh, blade that you grind, each one that you make, and um, and continue to push yourself. So your day job, you know, working as mm -hmm. uh, the the head of a auto shop, mm -hmm. um, had, I, I am sure that that experience, those twenty years, uh, you know, lent a lot to your knife making. But what about vice versa? Do you think learning this new craft, expanding your mind? Uh, in this way and um, expanding your creative ability in this way, has it changed your outlook, your approach or your skills or abilities with automobiles? Um, I don't know that it so much has, has changed that towards the automotive uh, world for me. Um, but definitely I, I've been able to take in, you know, clearly some of this stuff from, uh, from working on vehicles, um, you know, 
just my the way I've always looked at again working on cars. I've I've told people countless times when they're like, oh, I don't even understand, you know, how you can figure out what goes where and how to diagnose what. And my motto has always been, I look at it like a puzzle, right? I look at a car like a puzzle. It's just a large puzzle with moving pieces. And once you get that, once I get that in my mind, you know, I'm not a smart guy, but I can sit there and crank out a puzzle. And, uh, and so I kind of take that to the knife stuff, right? This is like a puzzle that you have to create yourself. And, um, you know, you take all these pieces and you, you assemble them in a, in a way. And so I've definitely been able to put that in, in, the, in place there. Looking forward, uh, this is the fantasy part of looking forward. Um, what is the knife you want to make? Uh, what What's like a dream knife that your skills are not up to yet, but something that you've thought about making that you look forward to attempting? Um, so I, I definitely, you know, I said I, I don't forge, um, but there there is, again, I've made a, a good friend here in town and uh Actually, through buying my grinder, a um, uh, guy named Brian House, he he sells uh, he's got a house made industrial this business, and he does grinder kits that you can weld together mm. for the two by seventy two grinders. Uh, I just lucked on that he's here in town, and through that we've built a really good friendship over this last year, uh, really quick. Uh, we both seem to work well together and and get along, and so uh, he has cool toys, and so I'm able to you know we're able to forge out some Damascus one night. And uh, so that is really cool whenever you've got the cool tools to be able to do it. And, um, but ultimately the knives, regardless of uh, Damascus and that kind of stuff, man, daggers scare me. You got four grind lines, you got to match up and that scares me. And you got to really dedicate some time to perfecting that. And I just have not made time to go and perfect grinding out a dagger. And that's, one thing, one day, one of these days I'll do, I'll push myself to, to, uh, throw a couple blades in the trash, grinding them out for sure. <laughs> uh, were you, uh, I know you were at Blade Show, uh, 2021. Did you happen mm -hmm. to see any of the guys who were showing off their five, um, master Smith test knives for the ABS? I did not see any of those knives. Oh, However, I did. I saw you yeah, had Dennis Tyrell on the other, yeah. the other day. And yeah. I did get to meet him and talk with him. And he had one of his knives there, a, a large Bowie. Oh, yeah. And good night. Some of the, that guy does incredible work. And, he, you know, and those things are, are just bonkers. They're out of this world. He does. Do, uh, but we were talking about um, one of the knives you have to make when you're when you become a master smith is a quillion dagger. Mm -hmm. and so it's an old school like the kind of dagger you would you would have in your left hand when you were dueling in the renaissance or whatever you know right. so it's very complicated um uh what's it called a fluted spiral handle and all this so i mean you're talking about grinding out the blade of a dagger and uh of course this quillian dagger thing is you testing all sorts of skills not just that but to me uh i i i totally know what you're saying because uh, i have a, a a nice little sub collection of daggers and that's one of the things that i marvel about um i don't use them it's not like i carry them around or anything but i just look right. at them and and their symmetry and i think the only one i have that's hand ground is is a uh, randall made and then everything else is from a machine and 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 i'm assuming that it's easier when you do it in a machine because that's oh, yeah. that's four grinds that have to be exact yeah, for sure. I, that's so daggers definitely. Uh, that's something that's on my bucket list, and just getting the time to grind one out is uh, is what it's going to take. But uh, again, I've been so busy with what's been going on right now that finding time for extra projects is uh, is uh, few and far between. With you know having a full time job during the day, and then this is uh, pretty close to a full time job at night. And on the weekend, so uh, but a dagger that's one of those things that kind of scares me to to have to get all four of those grind lines lined up nice and even. And yeah, man, well, um, what what kind of place do you want Bald Man Knife and Tool to be in, say, in 10 or 20 years? Like, what do you see the ultimate Oof. vision of the company being? 
Uh, you don't have to put a time on it, however <laughs> long it takes. But I mean, what do you want the company to be? At its, yeah, at its I mean, I can say for the next, like I said, I can look forward in this next year and a half uh, year trajectory. Um, I would really like to be um, producing um, just a few models and doing drops and just really perfecting those grinds and introduce a few here and there. Um, but really, I, I again, I enjoy having a knife at a at a lower price point. You know, that like sub three hundred price point mm -hmm. um, for a handmade knife is uh, really a, a low price point for a handmade knife uh, at the end of the day. And that's really where I'm focusing on right now is being able to have something to offer in that range that guys can use. You don't feel bad about beating it up. You know. Uh, I really enjoy that type of knife that that's a user knife, uh, but still has that custom handmade uh, quality to it. Taking nothing away from production knives because there's no, no. incredible production knives. Sure. I mean, you can't get the, around that. Yeah. I mean, that's not the surprising part. The surprising mm -hmm. part is that humans can make such great knives by, yeah. by hand. Um, uh, so what kind of, um, advice would you give someone there's that guy out there uh who who much like many of us like re is good with their hands wants to do something collects knives already is is crazy about it and they just want to take a little step mm -hmm. and maybe see if it's right what and would you suggest first i i would suggest the thing that i did which was grab an old file anneal it sit there with a hand file after it's annealed and some sandpaper and just go to town uh like i said those first two knives i did i did wind up grinding the bevels with that one by 30 you know you can get a one by 30 so cheap um uh, that it really is um it's so accessible you go to harbor freight it's you find them on sale for like 50 bucks or under and um just do it you just have to get the steel um and and start grinding stuff out to to figure out if it's something you like and make yourself some knives. Don't, don't even worry about making other people knives, make yourself some knives and uh, just enjoy the process of, of learning it along the way. Um, that was honestly, those first couple knives were so enjoyable. That that's what, that's what got me bit and really got me to enjoy it was uh, those first few knives seeing taking a bar of steel, uh, you know, a tool and turning it into another tool, however ugly it may have been. And it is ugly, um, that it was something I made and I could be proud of that. So that would be my advice is go grab some steel, go buy a, you know, a blank of some handle scales and get after it. Great. And, and if they say, but Brent, I don't know anything about, uh, heat treat, send it off. Send Find it a good off, place, man. Peter's Heat Treat or wherever. I used to that. Right. Send it off place. or, you know, look around. Find some local guy that's making, I guarantee you within 50 or 100 miles of you, there's going to be a guy uh, that's made knives. Um, and he'll be able to, He, come on, knife guys love hanging out and talking to other <laughs> yeah. knife guys. We know that. So um, that's that would be what to do. They'll heat treat it for you, I'm sure. Yeah. No doubt. Well, hey, Brent, thanks for coming on the show, man. I really appreciate uh, meeting you again, having you come on and uh, tell us about your your journey thus far. And um, well, I can't wait to catch up with you at Blade Show. Are you going to be there this year? I will be there and I will have a table. You so, will have a table. Do you have a table number cool. yet? I do. I don't have it on hand, but I am going to be in the main room for sure. Okay. Um, I know my table's in the main room. So yeah, man, I'm excited. This is going to be my first year to, to do a table at Blade Show, and uh, it, it'll be a lot of fun. I'm sure it'll be stressful, but it'll be fun. It will be fun. And just one one little thing to close with is that you, you were talking about keeping the, the price of the knives low, mm -hmm. and um, $200, $250, $300 for a handmade knife is not a lot. <clears throat> and that's kind of how I have broken into custom knives. And actually, uh, I'm... I'm I am equally fixed blade lover as I am folder, so it's not like I'm I'm reaching for some. Uh, so all I'm saying is fixed blade custom knives are a great way to really maximize your money 
and yep. get a great knife and 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 keep your money here and keep yeah. it with small businessmen. So thanks, Brent, for coming on the show. I appreciate it, man. Well, I appreciate it, Bob. Thanks. All right. Take care. Do you carry multiple knives, then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Brent Smith of Bald Man Knife and Tool. Check him out on Instagram under that same name. And do, do check out that quarter inch thick clipper EDC knife. It is not only charming, uh, but it'll beat up your knife, no doubt. Uh, check us out here next week for another uh, interview with a great knife person. And uh, Thursday night, of course, it's Thursday night live, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here on YouTube. Switch, and, or I'm sorry, Twitch and uh, Facebook. Uh, so until next time, thank you, Jim, for working your magic behind the switcher. I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.